Oh, well, he's very popular, Ed. The sportos, the motorheads, geeks, sluts, bloods, wasteoids, dweebies, dickheads. They all adore him. They think he's a righteous dude. That is why I have got to catch him this time. To show these kids that the example he sets is a first-class ticket to nowhere. Oh, Ed, you sounded like Dirty Harry just then. Really? Uh-huh. <laughs> And welcome to the Revolutionary Radio Project. I'm your host, Rob Skiba. And tonight I have four guests who will be joining us for this broadcast. Mark Sargent, Patricia Steer, Bob Nodell, and Jaron Campanella. And I invited them on because um, I recently saw a few videos and I wanted to talk to them about it. One of them was a video that I was actually a part of, at least uh, sort of behind the scenes, watching and streaming live in a three-hour uh, live broadcast with Jaron. Uh, through my cell phone. Uh, but before we get into these videos, I'd kind of like to get caught up with my guests. I haven't spoken with them in a while, at least uh, probably since November. So, uh, you know, I don't think we need to go through introductions. I've been on their shows before. They've been through, uh, I've been on their shows. They've been on my show. So let's just go ahead and jump in. Um, let's see. Ladies first, Patricia, are you there? Yes, I am, Rob. Thanks for having me on. I'm looking forward to this discussion. Yeah, me too. So what's been going on in your world since uh, the November conference well i took a little break for a while and then i came back guns blazing well not literally and have been doing lots of shows on lots of different topics so kind of uh the whole thing continues looking into all sorts of lies we've been told and of course the flat earth any interesting guests on flat earth and other hot potatoes nah <laughs> no <laughs> yeah, definitely. Every single person, all sorts of channels from tiny channels with less than a couple hundred subscribers to, to much bigger channels. I'm not going to name names and all of that, but I do encourage people to check it out at Flat Earth and Other Hot Potatoes on YouTube. Yeah, right on. All right, Mark, what about you? Anything interesting? Any guests on Strange World? What's been going on in your world since November? Uh, subject matter experts come and go on Strange World. Uh, mostly I've been trying to promote the the film, the documentary that was released in November, which we're going to talk about, uh, doing a lot of the film festival stuff and doing some damage control, <laughs> trying to spin it as well as I can. Uh, but yeah, other than that, just staying really, really busy. I think my channel now has... 1300 videos or so on it flat wow. earth. Yeah. 1300 that's a lot yeah it is there's a lot of flat earth videos but yeah I'm right on I'm, but i'm far from burned out so 2019 should be a banner year good all right right on so um bob and jaron i don't know if this was just a rumor um i haven't really been on the youtube a whole lot lately did uh globebusters also take a little bit of a break or are you guys still been doing videos all along uh, no, actually, we did take a break. Um, I decided that uh, I wanted to take the holidays off, uh, time kind of to, you know, cool down a little bit and uh, regroup. So we took about uh, six weeks off, and uh, now we're back doing it again. Very good. And Jaron, you also have a show. Anything interesting in your world since the last time uh, we spoke? Uh, no, just um, you know, they did that Monterey Bay uh, test, the mirror observation. And so we've been working with those guys to see if we can get back there and do it again before uh, the winter goes away, because uh, I'm sure we'll talk about that when we get to the Salton Sea and what happens when you look across water when it's, you know, 120 degrees versus when you do it in the winter and you can actually see a mirror reflection from 13 miles away. So, no, I hope to be doing that again soon and just been posting videos a lot and um, doing some live streams and uh, before we got started, uh, Rob, I did tell all my you know viewers that were listening um, just that you've always been amazing to me. You've been a really good friend, and I appreciate that more than you know, so I'm happy you have me on the show. Always enjoyed our chats, and uh, just wanted you to know that, that I appreciate your friendship. Yeah, right on, and, and the feeling's mutual for, with everybody here, actually. Uh, thank you guys so much for coming on. It was last-minute notice. I know I kind of contacted everybody today and said, hey, you guys interested in coming on? Everybody was uh, very excited about it, so I'm excited to jump in as well, but before we do, before we get into the, we want to talk about the Behind the Curve documentary and 
the National Geographic piece they did on Flat Earth and the ridiculous tests that were performed <laughs> on the Salton Sea this past summer. Uh, but before we go there, I'd like to get you guys thoughts on the um, what's his name? Owen Benjamin, I think. Uh, his his little meltdown there about debating Eric Dubay. Uh, I saw the one where David Weiss had added commentary to it. it you know, I got to say, for me, it was very um, cathartic. Um, I was just kind of feeling a, a bit depressed. And Sheila says, have you seen this? And I, and I laughed. I like belly laughed really hard, not at him, but with him because – he, he, that 25 minute or so video that he put out was me for a year and a half. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. I think we all could relate to it. Um, I've also heard people say, Oh no, he's a shell. He's a plant and all that. I see him as being genuine and maybe either this is what he's really going through or this is his way of, um, soft, uh, soft selling it or soft peddling it to his audience to bring them along the journey that he's been going through. Either way, I think he's legit. Yeah. Yeah. Me too. In fact, Rob, it's funny cause I have mentioned you and Owen in the same sentence. Every time I listened to him, I was going, this is, this is what Rob went through. Only he didn't put it on, on a live stream. That's, that's the difference. <laughs> I mean, he was going through it literally. It was like somebody, turning into like a flat earth werewolf literally live <laughs> on camera and you know Bill he's, Collins. Like, he's like contorting <laughs> you know and it's like wow that's really incredible i would have thought he would have turned the camera off by now but he didn't <laughs> so good for him seriously yeah. six six thousand people in a live stream well we'll take it sure yeah anytime i hear that phil collins song uh, that you played when you <laughs> shut things down I, it, I i only think of you now i don't think of the video or the when the music came out i just think of you rob <laughs> Uh, well, yeah, I was having a meltdown just like that for a good year, at least a year. Uh, so it was, you know, I don't know if that was a legitimate expression of what he's going through or if it was an act. But either way, it was <laughs> rather cathartic, I thought, anyway. Well, it didn't seem like an act to me, you know. And I really, he's the kind of person that you need to be to get into this this kind of flat earth talk and, and this kind of line of research. Because you really have to be unafraid of the social uh, kickback that you're going to get. And I think there's so many people that may start looking into it, may ask a friend, may ask a family member. And as soon as they're told they're an idiot, as soon as they're told it's already been decided, I think that they shy away from it. And the fact that he didn't do that right when he started getting that kickback, he just started banning people and getting rid of them altogether. Mm -hmm. um, so I think that, um, you know, I don't know when he'll come along. It may be, you know, a while um, because there's a lot of research that you need to do. And, and, you know, I think David Weiss always says it best when he says, if you believe me, um, then, then that's, you're bad. You know, you really need to do your own research. And we all know, Rob, you said it took you a year and a half. Um, it took me several months. And uh, I think the same goes for all of us until we were okay with making videos about it or okay with talking about it. Cause there's so much research that goes into it and you really need to, uh, peel back kind of the, you know, the veil of secrecy that's been, you know, shrouded around the idea of the globe. So, you know, for me, I just think it's a matter of time until he comes along and uh, I hope to be there when he does. Yep. Yeah. Is he now he mentioned having he's going to have a debate with Eric DeBay. Has that date been set or is it still no, on? The debate hasn't been set yet. In, is in it fact, really going to happen, though? Because I've seen DeBay in comment sections. Sorry, Mark. Of okay. other people's videos saying really bad things about Owen Benjamin. Mm. So, you know, mm. I don't know. Yeah, I don't think it's. I don't think it's going to happen. I think that they kind of had a little back and forth war of words a little bit in the yeah. chat. Saw, um, so I don't think it's going to happen. But I have heard him mention ODD, and then I contacted ODD and said, "Hey, are you interested in talking to Owen if he ever reaches out?" And he said, "Yeah, why don't we both talk to him?" And I said, "Well, I don't. He's never mentioned me. I don't know why you'd say that." And he says, "Dude, he tags you in all his Instagram posts." So I was really? like, oh, I "Didn't even know nice. he was just my videos." So, um, so yeah, one of these days when he starts talking flat Earth, if we can get. You know, maybe uh, the Flat Earth community in that chat to kind of point out that ODD and I are there or whoever else is there that's willing to talk to him. Maybe he'll take a look. But his chat runs so fast. Um, yeah, I can't keep up with my chat. Fast. And there's, you know, less than a thousand people in there when when he's got six thousand people, which, by the way, if you've ever seen a, you know, a comedy show at like, um, I don't know, Radio City Music Hall, um, you know, the capacity of that place is like six thousand. So if he's getting 6,000 people a night to listen to his live stream. That's amazing. That's like filling Radio City Music Hall every night. Pretty yeah. impressive. Yeah, And they're quality rants. I mean, let's face it. The man can can go off. I mean, I've yeah. <laughs> three, four hours, no problem. It doesn't even – hardly comes up for breath. It's amazing. 
I and tend to agree with a lot of the stuff he says, too, that's off the topic of the flat earth um, mm-hmm. about being a real man. I mean, he's a hunter and I'm not into that. That's the one thing. But other than that, just being a real man and loving his family and uh, just a lot of things about the guy seem really legitimately great. And he's he's right down the road from here. Just just so you guys know, I put a soft pitch out to him, not not through the chat rooms, just a little email. It says, hey, you're going to get together. You know, I could be there in 90 minutes, but I, whatever, whoever he reaches out to, great. I'm, I'm just happy he's taking, taking the journey. Yeah. I'm well, yeah. Same. And he's, you know, he's I'm taking it seriously. Whoever he ends up debating. I mean, look, when I went into the debate with Syngenis, I had to take literally an entire month and do nothing but like study this guy. It's like, it's one thing to know what you think, you know, whatever that is. Uh, but when you're going into the ring with somebody else, it's like a boxer knows how to box. But he doesn't just jump in the ring with anybody. He, you know, whoever the challenger is, he watches reels of that guy's fighting style and gets to know how to fight that particular person. Yeah. So well, with I, him, he's going to have to – not only does he have to figure out who he's going to debate and you know, if he's going to take it seriously, study that person and you know, what they know and their tactics and whatnot. But he's also got to, as he looked like he was doing in that video rant, look into the topic itself. Yeah. I, I don't think he was ever going to do a debate. I think it was mostly a, because uh, it was going to be an instructional thing where he was just going to, because he's, he's using too much of our verbiage already. And you've seen him. He's, you know, he will not condemn flat earth mm-hmm. and most of the other people will, and he won't do it. You know, he'll, he'll, you, you've heard the lines like, oh no, I'm not a flat earther. I'm not a flat earther. It's like, oh yeah. How, how many times have we heard that before? And then, you know, then you I can, are. I could, I could loan him Zetetic Agnostic if he wants to use it for a while. There you go. <laughs> All right. Well, let's uh, let's talk about the documentary uh, "Behind the Curve," mm-hmm. is the title of it, starring Mark Sargent as yeah. the lead protagonist, <laughs> and co-starring Patricia, Bob, Jaron, and Nathan Thompson as the evangelist. <laughs> <laughs> uh, and Flatsmacker. <laughs> yeah, the, they had these little titles under everybody's name. Uh, and of course, there's a, a fair amount of supporting uh, guest stars. And actually, they had several shout outs to Zen Garcia's Firmament book. That was pretty cool. Yeah. I don't know if, he's, if he got a chance to see yeah. that yet or not. I thought it was weird when I saw the film because I didn't know at all what the film was going to be when my part was filmed. You know, I I, I held up the Zetetic Astronomy book in my house. And then as I watched the film, I saw, oh, wait, there it is again. There it is again. It almost made it appear that this was the cult book of Flat Earth, which is odd because Mm. I showed those guys, uh, you know, Daniel. I showed Daniel who was filming lots of Flat Earth books, but that's Mm -hmm. the only one he put in the film. Yeah. Yeah, they had a lot of content to go through, you know, just to give you a a brief history of it. You know, they approached uh, me back in the spring of 2017 and we shot from spring of 2017 all the way to through the conference. And then I think some touch up stuff with Jaron after the conference, if I'm not mistaken. Then they edited the beginning of 2018 and then the premiere up in Toronto was April 30th of 2018. So they had a they spent a lot of time on it. I mean, it was it was pretty polished by the time they they got to it. But yeah, there was a it wasn't quite what I was expecting, but in some ways it was. Anyway, well, sorry, you know, ahead. when I hear about a documentary coming out on this, you know, you immediately think, okay, here's another hit piece. Uh, I didn't. I don't know if I had anything really in my head about what to expect other than that, perhaps. You know, it's just going to be another one of those hit piece type things. But, I, you know, it was all said and done. I think it was a well done documentary. Mm-hmm. Um, there was some creative editing, I could tell, that took place in a number of situations. And that's really why I wanted to bring you guys on to talk about it. Mm. Um, but, but how did you end up sort of being the primary focus, Mark? How did the like how did this project get started? And, and, uh, you know. he, Daniel Clark would just, was going through YouTube and he was noticing the, the huge uptick, you know, at the beginning of 2017, uh, there was, you know, this massive influx of flat earth videos, not, you know, not just 2015, 2016, by the time we hit 2017, in fact, it was right after, I think beginning of 2017 was the whole Kyrie Irving thing that, that took off. And so it, you know, it, it all of a sudden raised a lot of flags in, in media. And so he called me and, and he, it was just an exploratory thing. He said, look, I, I want to fly up and, and talk to you for a bit. And we sat down over pizza for, I think maybe an hour. And they said, you know what, let's get the freaking cameras out of the car and let's just start shooting some stuff. 
and that's that's what we did and by the you know by the time the the end of the first day was done we started talking about who else you know who, 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 potential people that should be involved in this thing and 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 events and different things we were going to cover and it was just it just kind of flowed naturally to where we shot in oh my god how many locations uh uh, Salem, Oregon, Seattle, uh, Houston, of course, with Patricia, Raleigh, Los Angeles, and uh, and then everybody else had you know shot where they were shooting. But it was it was quite quite an experience. Yeah. So the documentary kicks off right from the start. Mark Sargent walking on the beach, and yeah. I guess about seven minutes into the video, it sort of gives your wake up moment. And hopefully, this will work. I'm going to play a clip from that. Okay. Right now, I became a flat earther because I tried to debunk flat earth. Everybody that becomes a flat earther does the same thing. They say it's a stupid idea. I'm going to debunk flat earth, and then they get sucked in like the La Brea tar pits. When it came to this, I looked at it for literally nine months before I finally turned around. The Jerry Maguire moment that I had, I, I remember the date, I remember the time. It was February 10th, 2015, three o'clock in the morning, 3:30 in the morning to be exact. 3:30, Mark, really? Yeah, it was it was three thirty. I wasn't just making that up. <laughs> it you was three thirty in the morning. You should have said it was but, three. Come on. <laughs> I know. Well, hey, look, look I'm not going to take was... total blame. Remember, Chris Pontius' model. You know, Chris Pontius was also in the movie. Yes. The the yeah, model yeah. that he was working on was the thirty third model. And on September eleventh. So, hey, yeah, yeah. Blame that. blame Daniel Clark for the for the numerology well, on this one. Somebody might not know what we're talking about, but thirty three. Uh, that's a very important number in the world of looking into conspiracies, and so, yeah. uh, you know, it, whenever that number comes up, those with an alert mind will raise an eyebrow or two. And but you know what, thirty three is just a number. We were all thirty three at one time in our life. That doesn't mean that we were bad. You're so. not. 33 now? <laughs> well, yeah, I am, but still. <laughs> yeah, I thought one of these days I need to make a, a video that about myself that proves that I am an Illuminati show because I, <laughs> I look back at some of the things in my life. Like, I, I, you know, this would get a lot of hits too. Rob Skiba, absolute proof Illuminati show, right? I saw Star Wars 13 times and I've made that pretty well known. I grew up in Chicopee, Massachusetts, which is on the 72nd meridian. That's a big occult number. I moved down to Texas uh, and to Dallas on the 33rd parallel when I was 33. <laughs> and the first place I worked was for a freelance job for a company called 33 Parallel. So there you got it. <laughs> and then you got my my wedding date, which was uh, yes. an 11-11, which is, you know, that was back in 2011 before I knew anything about conspiracies or uh, numerology or anything. So I just got married on that date because we liked it. We saw 11-11 on the clock a lot. And I thought it would be the best way for me to easily remember my anniversary. And uh, so, yeah, now yeah, I hear it all the time. Oh, and they, they showed the plaque on their wall. It showed 11, 11, 11 in his house, and he's a mason. And, you know, what are you going to do? Yeah. Yep, and I, I just don't have any occult numbers associated with me. I feel really left out. <laughs> <laughs> I'm sure we can analyze your name and then put Globusters with it and distill it down to 30. Right. Yeah. If we send it through the calculator, I'm sure, with the reverse ordinal or the backwards ordinal, or so, we can find some numerology in there. Yeah, without a doubt. <laughs> For sure. So then you have the opening sequence there, and they did a good job with that, but they showed the Apollo 11 faking the Earth through the window in the opening sequence. Right. And that, that video actually shows up uh, several times yep. throughout the video. Uh, but so we, we kind of go through Mark's journey and, and his early clues that he puts out, and then this uh, astrophysicist, right? How many of those were in there? Yeah, Hanalore, I think was her name. Oh boy! Oh, the girl uh, with the, the pink hair who's now a brunette. Yeah, she comes on about ten minutes into the video or so, yeah. and uh, she's intrigued, right? She's like, "Oh, you know, flat Earth. This is interesting." She starts looking into it, and you mentioned the flight trackers, right? Uh, tracking the southern flights in one of your videos. So they show her going to a flight tracker site, and of course, she didn't watch this because I did that too. When when you said when that video came out and I watched that particular one, first thing I did was go look up a flight tracker. Uh, and yeah, you can see planes fly out a little bit, but then boop, they go bye-bye. Oh, sure. Plus, she wasn't looking at the latitude and longitude. That was the big point, uh, which was fine. You may be able to see the graphic, but click on the graphic and tell me where that plane is. You can't you can't prove the route without latitude and longitude. They they disappear at about 150 miles out. But, of course, creative editing, they weren't going to go into. They, you know, the edited... 
I won't say they were completely neutral here because the producers and the directors of the show were globalists. Let's get that on the, on the table right away. It, it was absolutely not a, a, a flat earth pro propaganda type piece. So. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Here's a little clip from that part of the video. Yeah, what, what, what's this? What's this guy doing? Seems to be going south. Where are you going, buddy? She's pointing at an airplane just off the coast. Yeah, where, where's that coming from? If not the southern hemisphere. This is a very easy test to perform. This is a very easy test to perform. <laughs> <laughs> like, in the way she does it, it's just so condescending. Like, totally. oh yeah, see, I just proved everything. So you know, if it were that easy, none of us would be here now. <laughs> right. <laughs> Yeah, if that's all you had to do to see that the Earth's a globe is just look at some flight software and say, oh, no, there's a plane there, then it uh, must be a globe. It's Where are you going, little guy? Smack. <laughs> <laughs> I, <laughs> I know. Where are you going? <sighs> yeah. Let's see here. Um, then they got a three, I think it's a three-minute clip here, um, talking about the uh, Dunning-Kruger effect and all that. Let me play this clip here. We tend to form the leaves based on a couple things. One is our intuitions, just what feels right. Another is our subjective experience. For most of us who look out on the horizon, indeed, it looks flat. That seems like a reasonable thing. And so you ask, okay, well, why are we saying that the Earth's round? If you don't have someone who's going to give you a satisfying answer, you might well then try to find alternatives. It's what you can observe. You don't need complicated math formulas to figure out where you live. But the powers that should not be have told us so. And trust us, believe us. And we have, I did, we all did. Something that you see a lot in science is imposter syndrome, which is a phenomenon where the more you know about a topic, the more you feel like you aren't actually an expert. You feel like you can't possibly be an authority on this. On the flip side, there's something called the Dunning-Kruger effect. The Dunning-Kruger effect is a psychological uh, finding that people who don't have uh, knowledge or expertise about something tend to have a false confidence that they are, in fact, very knowledgeable about something. It becomes this tendency to assume that you have all the facts, that what you know is everything that there is to know. If you get online, you'll see pages and pages of so-called evidence that seems scientific, Right, here's an equation, here's a diagram, and you go, huh, you know, maybe they're onto something there. Then I feel like that's just as good as an opinion of a physicist or a consensus of, you know, 20 physicists. We've all been brainwashed by scientism, by those priests. This is a way of thinking, starting at I don't know, then chipping away at the I don't know through evidence with no motive on where it takes you. And you come up with a new idea, and the first thing that's gonna happen is 10 people are gonna try to figure out why it's wrong. Okay, it's called institutional disconfirmation. So when you have conviction, it's really well earned. So to have a vendetta against that uh, is a little odd. Science should have wiped us out literally in the first month. And it's the oh. exact opposite. We're not just winning, we're crushing them because they don't know how to address it. Because they're not convinced they can knock it out, they don't wanna get into the ring. We've got questions out there which they can't answer. How much time do you have to, to spend on every theory that is out there, right? And many times uh, the things that we are debating are not even theories, uh, either because they're not falsifiable uh, or sometimes they've already been falsified. Absolutely ludicrous what they're teaching. You can't feel any of the movement. And they think, well, they, we go faster than a bullet through space. I'd say take physics. I mean, that's just fundamental. I mean, if you're driving in a car and I throw a ball up, and you're, where's the ball going to come down? It's going to come down in my hand. Okay, it's not going to fly through the back windshield of my car. Because it's an enclosed system. Wow. And they'll keep using that one over and over and over again. Yeah, and these are the people that, that, that say that uh, we're suffering from Dunning-Kruger syndrome exactly. uh, because we just wanted to go ahead and just believe in this stuff. And they will sit there and listen to the scientism priest and believe every word that they say and never look past that. And then, you know, and then to call us, you know, guilty of, of Dunning-Kruger is just beyond belief. Yeah, they talk about science and proceeding with no motive. Uh, really? Yeah, right. 
<laughs> and that that particular scientist with the uh, that the accent, he was the guy, if I'm not mistaken, that we grabbed because he's from Los Angeles. That the the Los Angeles Flat Earth chapters they did sit down debates with him for hours at, really? at a at an Airbnb. Oh yeah, yeah, they sat down with him and uh, and really you know really chewed on this for for some time. And he, he was, of course, he was never going to give in. You know, the conditioning is just way too thick. <laughs> but, but he was there. I mean, he, he sat down with him for multiple sessions. So I think it's him. interesting there, too, that Nathan said, uh, you know, they say we're flying through space, but we don't feel it. And, yeah, that may be true. But more importantly than we don't feel it is the fact that it's never been shown in any test or experiment that the Earth moves at all. So they, they leave those things out. You know, leave those things out that no test has ever shown it, that uh, I just did a video yesterday talking about it uh, it's ridiculous that it's which one is pseudoscience. It's the one that employs mathematical transform equations to make it possible that the earth can spin and move. That's it's well, no, no test shows it. Well, Jaron, don't forget. I mean, the, there was a test that, that showed the earth moving, right? It was supposedly me, <laughs> right. <laughs> which, which right. I, I never performed this test. And uh, supposedly, I, you know, Globusters proved that the earth was moving, well, but that's something that, you know, is coming up. Won't. These guys won't believe anything that we say. They won't listen to us at all until the second that this happens. And then they're going to use that as some sort of proof. They're going to a movie. You know, this guy, Godless Engineer, he watches this movie and then uses it as some sort of proof. It's like, do you not understand that it's a movie? That the guys who made the movie are, as, you know, as, as Mark just said, they're globe believers who uh, that's what the outcome of the movie was going to be. That that was their intent going in. Their intent was not to show that the earth is flat. So, it's just funny to me that that these guys will say everything J Bob and Jaron say is lies and this and that, but then they'll the second we say something that they think proves what they're saying. Oh, now look at what Jaron and Bob say. Look what yeah. Bob. <laughs> and they never listen to the rest of the story because never. of the rest of the story is actually what conclusively proves really that it's not moving. And we're going to break. We'll talk some more when we get back. All right. listening to the true, true, true frequency radio network no hate no hype no 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 fear We're back on the Revolutionary Radio Project. I'm your host, Rob Skiba, and this evening I'm talking with my guests, Mark Sargent, Patricia Steer, Bob Nodell, and Jaron Campanella. And uh, we're talking right now about the documentary Behind the Curve. Um, where is that available uh, if people wanted to check it out? You can get it right now from – sorry, let me uh... – Go back to the homepage on this. By the way, you can just go behind behindthecurvefilm.com is where all the information is, but you can stream it on iTunes, Amazon Prime, uh, YouTube, movies, and, of course, Google Play. And everywhere else, I don't know. I mean, I, I don't think it's on Netflix or Roku or something like that, but, I mean, those big four, you should be able to find it. Cool. Yeah. So, yeah, right before the break, we were talking about a, a three-minute clip I played from the documentary talking about the so-called Dunning-Kruger effect, which just, like like Bob said, just kind of cracks me up because, I mean, here these people have absolutely no idea about our origins, and yet they pretend they know everything about it. And it's in every textbook, you know, from the Big Bang to evolutionary biology, like they know everything, but they know nothing. Is that not the exact definition of the Dunning-Kruger effect? Well, I think yeah. I think Dunning-Kruger is is something to the effect of uh, you're too dumb to know how stupid you actually are. There you go. Uh, <laughs> yeah, you're yeah you're you're too dumb to know yeah exactly to know the information to absorb the information that that well, you're you're peddling you're pushing stuff out without you know you're you're saying stuff but you have no backing behind it. And yet you think you're the authority on it. Yeah. 
Exactly. It's insulting to be accused of that when it's really what they are. It's so weird. It really is. And most of these people don't understand that, you know, we, we all went to the same schools that they did. Mm-hmm. Uh, we all grew up believing the exact same thing. And obviously, you know, if they think that we have any intelligence at all by, you know, some of the things that we talk about, they should have to wonder, you know, it's like, well, maybe there is something to this and maybe we should look into a little bit deeper. But that uh, I think for some people that really goes against their belief system and um, it's it's very threatening to them. And so they have to kind of lash out at it. Well, it's scary that you got a son that we're all told is 93 million miles away, but nobody knows. So when you've got somebody who's starting to bring some of these things up, like, hey, where's the proof of these things that we were taught? The distance of the sun, the distance of these other planets, the, uh, they, they get very confused because it is scary to realize, oh, wait, these are beliefs that were indoctrinated into us before we were able to walk. So I think that that is an extremely scary thing for anybody um, to kind of start. And then you have to realize, well, man, do I really want to go back and reshape my entire belief system? And for anybody who's got any kind of education or thinks they're smart or is a Ph.D., uh, it's just impossible for them to even consider that they might have been lied to and that what's written in textbooks may not be the truth. And this goes uh, uh, quite a ways back. I mean, I recently read um, actually pretty close to right before the conference, read King's Dethroned, uh, which is one of those books that seems to kind of get lost, I think, maybe because of the title. It kind of throws people off. But, uh, I mean, when you realize how they came up with the numbers mm-hmm. and the methods they used to come up with the numbers that we're still using today, it's like, really? How did anybody take this seriously? Right. Have you guys read that book? Yeah, yeah. it's one of the best. Yeah. Yeah, no, it's scary. I mean, for for me, it's just, you know, they always flip things upside down, right? As we say, they, you know, they tell us the opposite. And isn't it funny that in their model, the earth is literally, um, you know, 0.000000001% of the entire universe, whereas I believe that the earth is 100% of the universe. The, the earth is all there is. So to me, it's such a, a big eye opener when you start to realize that these guys will flip it completely. You know, they they want to make the earth as unimportant um, as possible. And so they've completely removed it. And that's how you grow up. You grow up believing you're just one of many spinning, and I don't mean many, I mean trillions of spinning planets spinning around other stars. Uh, it makes it very unimpressive uh, when really you need to look around and realize how impressive and amazing and beautiful this place is. I hate the word universe too, because that implies, you know, these light years and these planets and, you know, life on other planets. And I try to even avoid that word, just making us less and less important. Although to be fair and Rob will appreciate this. And that is the, the word universe has been taken in the film industry so many times now to mean smaller things, mostly a cinematic universe that now I, when I think of the word universe, even though my initial reaction is like, oh crap, that thing is so monstrous. Uh, when they talk about the other uses of sin- of universe, it's much, much smaller. So I, it doesn't bother me that much anymore. I just recently started binge watching Star Trek Next Generation again. Mm. And I'm into season three now. Yeah, And, you know, I still enjoy it. If I, I appreciate it more for the fiction that it is probably even more than <laughs> before when right. I believed that it was possible for us to go where no one has gone before, but everywhere they go, they keep meeting people that speak English. <laughs> right. <laughs> U- Universal translator, man. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Even though the lips sync up. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> yeah absolutely. <laughs> so, uh, uh, I forgot who it was. I don't know if it was, I think Jaron mentioned godless engineer, mm-hmm. um, the YouTuber, and there's another guy, what's his name? Simon Dan, I think is his name. Simon Dan, yeah. Yeah, both of them have recently put out videos against me because they're kind of breaking down my uh, presentation from the November conference. And, you know, it's like one of these things where I watch these videos like this and I'm yelling at the screen going, yeah, but, yeah, but, yeah. <laughs> like mm. I could spend the rest of my life making yeah, but videos. Yeah, but, it's ama- it's amazing, by the way, how many channels now are dedicated against flat Earth. I mean, dedicated to where I mean, there's there, I can't even count them anymore. There's yeah. just a whole bunch of them that just that's that's what they live for. To where you know they have de- dedicated days, and when well, some channels just every day they'll just pick a different target. 
And large yeah. amounts of subscribers, which I think is pretty suspect. Because when I go away from YouTube, the internet, and the whole flat earth thing, and go into the quote-unquote real world where everyone thinks we live on a globe, no one's fighting against flat earth. No one's thinking right. about flat earth. So how could there be these channels with these large numbers of subscribers <laughs> of people yeah. fighting the flat earth, unless maybe those aren't real subscribers? Oh, no. well. Simon Dan is absolutely fraudulent, no question. I mean, he it's the numbers are so bad there that even our garden variety trolls were going against him <laughs> because they were jealous. It's like, what is this? <laughs> it's like you're getting a million hits on your channel in a day? Come on, man. You know, yeah. and against flat earth, no way. And no their way. arguments are so unbelievably weak, too. You know, yeah. I mean, just like the we just had to uh, debunk a video by the godless engineer about this whole thing about Globusters prove the rotation of the Earth with their ring laser gyroscope. And I mean, literally in that video, he had every single point wrong from, you know, from claiming that it was me that did the test. It was me that had the ring laser gyroscope. Um, and, and then saying, well, you're just so dumb. You don't understand how a gyroscope works. And why would you ever think that the it's the stars rotating above what would ever give you that idea, you know, to, to even test for that? And I just said, you know, two words, Aries failure. And then uh, I greatly elaborated on that. And it was, it was really quite easy to debunk, especially if you understand the, the history of some of the ancient experiments, not ancient experiments, but, but the experiments that took place about 100 years ago, Michelson-Morley, Michelson-Gale, Aries Failure, Sanyak, um, all of these things, you know, which are largely buried or obfuscated, um, come out and prove absolutely, you know, what I was talking about. And it made perfect sense that we would uh, get the same results with the ring laser gyroscope, or I should say the person in our group that actually did the test, not me. Um, he got exactly the same results that uh, Mickelson Gale did. So, you know, what was the explanation? Well, it was all explained 100 years ago. So, but they don't ever look into that. No. Well, yeah, the way the video, it, it, we'll actually get to it because I've got this kind of set up in pro, uh, chronological order here. Uh, that comes up at about 48 minutes into the video. It makes it look like the way you're talking that you actually did the test. So, of course, it's all in the editing. Yeah. Yeah. I, I, well, yeah, I said our group, but I actually said point blank that a member in our group mm. did that. I mean, that's actually in there. So they completely ignored that. And beyond that, what really upset me about that was uh, when Daniel was here. I mean, he was very interested in the ring laser or the fiber optic gyro test. And uh, he wanted to know, he kept emailing me and says, you know, what's what's the result? What have we figured out about this? And so I did a show on it where I did a complete reveal on, you know, the results that we got and also, uh, you know, the rebuttal to it. And he completely ignored it, just absolutely didn't even acknowledge it, didn't put any of it in the movie. So at that point, I was just thinking, you know, these guys are just out to make a hit piece. Um, because out of all that content that, that I gave them and Jaron gave them, and I'm sure Mark and Patricia did, it just seems like he really cherry picked the stuff that would make us look really bad. Okay. He yeah, yeah, he he did cherry pick, no question, uh, to where even before I saw the very first screening of it in a hotel room in Canada, uh, he asked me afterwards, well, I should say he asked me right afterwards, did I mind, you know, the, the famous green button scene where okay. Patricia and I had walked <laughs> away from the, the simulation thing at, at NASA and he, he zoomed, he didn't even mean to at the time. He just left the camera there. He was waiting for us to leave. And he thought, oh, with some creative editing, you know, we'll do, I absolutely hit that green button. But, yeah. you know, two yeah, seconds they make worth it look of editing. Like, they made it look like you were just thinking it was a touch, a, a touch screen where you're hitting yeah. the, the monitor. Yes. And yeah. then they pan down as if this idiot didn't know that the button right. right next to him. And yep. because of that, he's such an idiot that, well, yeah, we know flat earth fake. We know that's a lie. He's not smart enough to figure out we live on yeah. a globe. That was yeah. what was implied. No, yeah, it was. No question. No question. Yeah, so, and, I, oh, go ahead. Uh, to, well, to be fair, I mean, Daniel was asked, I mean, you know, when, when they did their Q&A stuff on stage, the very first question that was always, to, always asked of them was, are you guys flat earthers? Always. And they, of course, you know, Daniel's one of those types, you know, he's, he's in denial and uh, <laughs> he was never good. And even if they, because if they would have answered yes, if any of them would have answered yes, the tone would have changed in that audience because, you know, that's like, oh, okay. So it's a propaganda piece, but anyway, sorry, go ahead. Well, I, I do have to add one thing about Carolyn Clark, who's also involved in this film, Daniel Clark and Carolyn Clark. 
different. They're not married. They're not, not married. related. Just same last name. But uh, back in 2016, she entered a film into a documentary, a short film that lasted 20 minutes. It's called Patrolling Sandy Hook. Now, I didn't know about her work on this before I said yes to be involved in this documentary. And of course, it is about Sandy Hook. And it's her co-directing debut. And this is when she was an undergraduate. It was a documentary production course at the University of Notre Dame. And, you know, she previously worked for the Ready, everyone? National Geographic Channel and National Ooh. Geographic Studios. And this film takes the uh, viewpoint that Sandy Hook is exactly what was portrayed by the mainstream media. Mm. And uh, that anybody who thinks that no children died or that it was, you know, not what we've been told is bad and wrong. So mm, that made me worry. I wish I would have seen that before I went in the film. <laughs> Yeah, I wish we all kind of uh, we'd all take it back probably if we had a second yeah. chance. Yeah, I but, mean, but, but yeah. we trusted because they were so nice. Right, uh, Daniel. Uh, Daniel came by my house. He came inside. He talked to me on the couch. Uh, me too. Uh, filmed me at my dinner table talking. None of that stuff made the movie. Uh, one of the things I was you know really upset at is that I didn't live in the best location at that time. Um, but our house was decent. I mean, as far as what it looked like inside, everything was nice. And he doesn't show any of that. And what he did is he went outside my house and turned the camera. And filmed my neighbor's house, who was, it's a disaster, and it's like held up by like bricks, and it's got a bunch of stray cats everywhere. Well, he filmed that and inserted it in the movie, so it looks like it's my house. So oh, it's I told, I, until you said that just now, I thought that was your house. Right. So and see, did I. <laughs> and anybody would, because that's the way it was filmed. It was filmed like that on purpose. And if you, yeah. you know, if you go and ask him now, just like I've told him before on text messages, I said, you know, if somebody asks you if that's my house, you're going to tell him no, right? Oh, yeah. And just like I said, you know, somebody asked you if that was really the experiment result that you showed at the end of that movie, you're going to tell them it wasn't right. And uh, at least according to what I've heard, uh, you know, David Weiss, you know, brought it up to him at the live premiere in New York and said, hey, is that, you know, did you misrepresent the experiment at the end? And he said, oh, yeah, well, we kind of, you know, edited. And so, I mean, they admit it, um, oh, yeah. but they yeah. did. Well, so they're I think engaging they, in, in, yeah. at, the, at the 30 minute mark. They talk about confirmation bias. I'll just play that. Nobody wants to admit that they've been fooled, but the reality is it's happened to every one of us. Confirmation bias is one of the most solid empirical findings in psychology. If I have a belief or an attitude, I will search for instances that confirm what I believe. And also, I'll find myself in a company with a lot of other people who think the same way as I do. Uh, isn't that what like the entire scientific community is guilty of doing? Yeah. Yes, and all the Globers, <laughs> absolutely. Uh, yeah. Like, wow. I mean, even more so, I would say, than we do. And those guys oh, absolutely. say that in the movie and not even not even notice what they're saying. Yeah, I can't believe it. We who are involved in exploring the whole Flat Earth Awakening, we all have slightly different, I would imagine, different viewpoints of how all of this works. We're all looking in different areas and doing different things on YouTube and TFR and wherever. We wouldn't all agree with how things, the map, the model, the sun, the moon, we may have different views, but when it comes to the globe cult, they all believe the exact same thing. Yeah. Yep. And they get together and they have their attaboy parties. Mm -hmm. <laughs> so then we get a little further into the video and we're introduced to the villain of the story. <laughs> oh God. <laughs> or they are otherwise known as the king of flat earth but we um, didn't know he was going to be in it we, we, we literally it. that was, no one that was knew. the one thing that patricia and i were absolutely surprised we had to read about it in a newspaper when we went to the premiere because it because i i looked at her and go wait is matt in this because i'm reading oh, this yeah. matt's in this let me play that let me play a <laughs> clip Ma on i'm that. sorry math powerland everybody hang on matt wanted to be the king of flat earth but he wanted to do it on his terms. I started this fighting the tension that caused the flat earth. That's how the flat earth started. Which is not what happened. Here you just kept growing bigger and bigger and bigger. And he just, his voice just became lost in the wind to where all of a sudden we started, you know, the conference was announced down in North Carolina and he was invited. And he said, no, I, I'm not going to do the comment. You know, why should I be in a room with you guys? You're nothing without me. That, that whole song and dance. And that was just annoying. So now it's getting more serious. Mark Sargent is uh, what I always thought. He's been sent in in kind of an intelligence fashion working with Hollywood. Well, Mark Sargent's not Mark Sargent. 
It's Warner Brothers, you idiots. And I told you, Warner Brothers has a deal with the Pentagon, the CIA. <laughs> wow. And, and they Brothers show his, what, what cracked me up is they show his, his list of demands, and I'm just going to read it. It says, when asked to appear in the film, Matt stipulated that he received $5,000 12% of profits, creative control, a guarantee that he be featured in 25 to 50% of the film, and that we support his unverified claim that Mark Sargent is secretly a Warner Brothers executive using an alias. And then there's like this little pause, and then it comes up. We were unable to meet his demands. Yeah. That, <laughs> that was, part was funny. <laughs> that was absolutely true. And what, yeah. w- it was amazing because, and Patricia knows this, I mean, they reached out to him three different times. That was only after the third time that he finally, you know, they finally said, okay, enough is enough. But then they figured out, wait a minute, what if we just use his clips? We don't have to interview <laughs> him. And, it's, and and that worked. But yeah, that was absolutely true. He he made those demands. And uh, yeah, Warner Brothers told me to say that I, I officially do not endorse that part of the movie. So. <laughs> Yeah, it was ridiculous. I, I, but but yeah, he was made. Of course, I mean, I mean, you know, filmmaking, Rob. Uh, somebody had to be the antagonist, and it was really strange because when you're talking, when they're interviewing all the scientists and the psychologists and everybody else, everybody was really cordial. You yeah. know, they were smiling and nice for the, you know, because they're being nice for the cameras. The only person that really could be the villain in this was Matt. Well, and so as I, and I thought he was perfect. But, you but know, it was Matt. Like, but what Matt was doing at the time when this was being filmed is exactly what you just heard. So they didn't have to like search through many videos. No. They just basically trained the camera on whatever his YouTube channel was showing at that moment and filmed yeah. right off it. So it's not yeah. that he was portrayed as the villain. At that point in time, he was, he was. being the villain. Yeah. Oh, and it only got worse. I mean, when we were oh, in yeah. Canada, we were all looking at lawsuits when we came back. Yeah, yeah. yeah. Still waiting <laughs> for mine. <laughs> yeah, and he hadn't even seen it yet. And I I swore, I, and he didn't do it. I was amazed. I swore that if he ever got a copy of the film, he would make a video where he would just have this epic meltdown that would put, you know, Owen Benjamin to shame, <laughs> where he would just start just pounding on the keyboard to where it'd break and then the, the camera would go dead. He's forgotten so. about it now. He's forgotten about that he's suing all of us and that he owns all of us and all the other things. I don't know what he's doing now, but I think he's just let, like every other sort of threat, just let it go. Well, Moved he's on. on he's on chemtrails right now, which is something that I've been really considering getting, you know, more vocal about and, and talking about. I actually started documenting stuff about this time last year uh, to as far as the patterns uh, of when they start spraying here in Dallas. Uh, so I can only imagine that if any of us start talking about chemtrails, he's going, I started it. Yeah. Oh, no. Yeah, he owns yeah. chemtrails now. But I'm glad that he's doing stuff on chemtrails. I'm glad yeah, anybody's doing yeah. anything on any of these things. It all needs to be exposed. But, you know, the stuff he said about Warner Brothers or whatever, like, what? Yeah. Well, oh, and a, a quick correction, by the way. Uh, he was not labeled in the film, if I'm not mistaken, as the king. He was labeled as the originator. Mm. Matt, yeah, he, in fact, no, his you, full thing, it was Matt Boylan, a.k.a. Math Powerland, a.k.a. The Originator. <laughs> Sounds like a rap name. <laughs> yeah. And the cartoon, the cart, the, the animated cartoon. versions. Of, I mean, when I saw the animated version of him on screen for the first time, I just I should tell you, my mouth just dropped. Yeah. And I said, oh, my God. <laughs> we were like halfway shocked watching it, uh, you know, in in because we saw the. We saw it before anybody else, Mark and I did. Yeah, yeah. And we never saw any outtakes or any like, uh, I think what people who are in films usually get to see what they call the dailies. We saw, none of us nope. saw any of this film until it was made. So we had no say so in what was going to be nope, used. Not a freaking Lots way. was left on the cutting room floor and lots was edited. But when we saw Matt on screen, we didn't really know he was going to be in it like that. And we just, our mouths fell open. We were kind of laughing and kind of cringing. It was the weirdest experience ever. Yeah. And yeah, the, and, the, and of course, right after that, that uh, astrophysicists you know, and astrophysicists, like, what do they do, right? I mean, William Shatner went around talking to astrophysicists, and then he came back and said, you know, science and science fiction is the same thing. And he talks about talking to uh, Michio Kaku, and of course, as only William Shatner can do, he's like, what do you do, you know? <laughs> and, and he's like, it's all in his head. It's just that it, they sit there and crunch numbers. So here this Hanalor woman comes on uh, right after that, uh, and she talks, and this is what she says. You cannot believe a flat earther theory without 
believing in some giant conspiracy because you have to have some reason why all this proof is wrong. And if it's wrong, then it had to have been faked. And if it was faked, well, there you go. There's your conspiracy. And what I always am most curious about is why would someone bother to fake all this? And when she says that, they show the footage of Apollo 11 faking the Earth through the window. Most people wouldn't even know what that was, though. That's the part that's funny. Yep. But you know what? She was, you know, in a way, she was kind of right. You know, you can't really get here, or it's a lot harder to get to flat Earth unless you have researched other conspiracies and found out, you know, there there comes a point if you're researching other conspiracies when you realize that it's like, you know what? These guys have lied to us about everything, and really, you can't put anything past them. And at that point, it makes it a lot easier to believe in it. But, uh, you know, they really have lied to us on every single level. And that's the one thing that that most people can never get their head around. Yeah, really well said, Bob. Yeah, that, that's the most important thing is once you start looking into other conspiracies and see that, you have you have no choice but to then you know address every conspiracy with the open mind of at least, well, could, is this possible that this is you know been lied to? And yeah, I know they think oh, all scientists are liars and all teachers are liars. No, none of us believe that. You know, none of us think that any you know scientists or, or teachers are out there lying on purpose. Yeah, that was actually the. A portion of the presentation that I prepared for uh, the November conference that I didn't get to do because I ran out of time, but it was going to address the whole, it's too big a conspiracy. You know, that's the, you know, if, if this is really, it's just too big, everybody would have to be in on it. It's like, no, most people would not have to be on it, in on it. Very few would actually have to be in on it. Right. Again, just, you know, go look at the video I did yesterday that talks about whether or not the earth spins and there's no test that's ever shown that it spins, but yet with a little bit of mathematics, you can use these transform equations to get people to think that it does move. And, and so, yeah, it's not that people are, are out there lying about it. It's that it's easy to mask some things from people. <clears throat> Excuse me. Right. And so many people actually believe, you know, that all these things happened that, um, you know, that's what the elite are counting on. They, they realize that they've got everybody buffaloed and that the sheep, basically the people out there are going to defend this for them. So that's, you know, that's a big part of this equation. Yeah, that's a great point right there. You know, when <clears throat> my family went out to uh, Hawaii for, it was my 10th anniversary, my sister's 20th and my parents' 50th. So we all did a big family thing. And, and part of it, we went out uh, snorkeling and we came back from, from doing our thing. We got on the, on the boat ride back. There's this young girl and she was talking about the fish that we saw and the corals and stuff like that. And she's talking all in evolutionary terms. And after we docked and everybody's leaving, uh, people are you know, saying thank you and whatnot. And the, the couple in front of us said to the girl, you did such a good job. That was just really you know, a great presentation. And she says, well, you know, I'm just glad that I was finally able to put my degree to good use. Mm. And, and I'm looking at that going, yeah, she's not in on the conspiracy. She went to school, an authoritative figure at the front of the room said something that she had no reason to distrust, so she believed it. And then, like you said, Bob, she is now the vocal piece for that and speaking with passion and zeal as if that's the truth. Yeah, absolutely. And that's exactly the way that they have designed it. Um, okay. you, you know, you really have to marvel at how amazing – I mean, the elite really do understand the human psyche mm -hmm. – um, a, you know, to the level that they can really get people to support their lies and, and back it up and even die for it. Uh, it's just, it's astounding. So, you know, if you, if you're religious, like I said, if you're religious, you attribute this to the devil. Um, if you're not religious, you understand that people uh, really are very, very dark and they can use their intelligence to manipulate people. That's right. Let's go to break. And we'll talk some more when we come back. into the truth frequency. We are TFR. TFR. Truth Frequency Radio.
And we're back on the Revolutionary Radio Project. I am your host, Rob Skiba. For the second hour of the broadcast, I'm talking with my guests, Mark Sargent, Patricia Steer, Bob Nodell, and Jaron Campanella. And uh, right before the break, we were talking about conspiracies. And, you know, I appreciate something uh, Robbie Davidson has said that, you know, you really kind of have to feel out the situation when you're talking to people. Like, where are they with 9 11 uh, in particular and the moon landing? If they believe the official story of either one of those, you might as well just talk about football or walk away or whatever. There's no point in going any further. Uh, so it, it, there's definitely truth to your eyes having to be open sort of in layers, I think, uh, before you can even be ready. And certainly that was the case for me. I had to go through a very specific process of realizing the lies that we've been told through you know, understanding various conspiracies. If I hadn't have done that, there's no way I could have. It took me a year and a half to embrace this as it is, it would have been even infinitely worse if I still believed in the moon landings or, you know, 9-11. Um, so I think there's something to that, you know, understanding and, and looking into some of these other conspiracies first. But then I think there's a danger also sort of on the flip side of this that we can tend to think that, well, everything is a conspiracy. And there's about a three-minute clip here in the video uh, in the documentary we're talking about behind the curve where Patricia talks a little bit about that as it pertains to uh, her herself. The funny thing is, is that I'm a conspiracy realist, but there's conspiracies about me. I look at episode 54 of Patricia Steer. These people I hire by section heads and supervisors in supervisor roles at NASA, the NSA, the FBI, CIA. These aren't regular people. It started off with me being called a shill, uh, as if I'm doing this for money. And then I was called a flat earth honeypot to bring men into flat earth and then steer them the wrong way because my last name is Steer. Uh, so what Patricia does is she's so pretty. All these guys. But that's a part of the lure of narcissistic, psychopathic women. I never thought that the name Patricia, which is my birth first name, would be spun into the fact that the last three letters are CIA in the word Patricia, which means I'm in the CIA because the government would be that dumb. But okay, if you want to believe it. Uh, other things that have been said that I'm a reptilian and people see my eyes shape shift while I'm on YouTube, that I drink blood most recent one is that I'm transgender. I mean, I I even threw up a question one day, what's up with Patricia Steer, you know? Because I don't know, but um, I don't know. Now, the thing about all of these things is I can't prove any of it wrong. I could and have shown people my birth certificate, my driver's license, photos of myself as a child, and they'll say, well, if you're CIA, all of that stuff can be constructed. People will still say you don't have a real family, that you don't have a brother and sister. Um, there's nothing that I can do. So, anybody can believe whatever they want to believe about me, but I wonder if in their hearts, people who do that know they're lying or are they so conspiratorial that they actually believe it then it makes me worry about maybe things i believe in am i like another version of that that's a pretty profound question right there uh patricia i'm kind of curious as to your thoughts after watching you know you, they did the interview with you but then after mm -hmm. seeing yourself uh on the screen what were your thoughts what's well, going through your mind I stand by everything I said there, even the part where, you know, the way I see some people acting with what they say on YouTube, it makes me think, wait a minute, these are people who also are engaged in discovering truth like me, but they've gone on a whole different direction. They've gone in over into the deep end, but then it makes me have to step back and reevaluate what I believe. But that doesn't mean after reevaluating what I believe, I've decided I live on a globe, though. So we all need to look, just like the scientific method, you have to do the experiments again and again and again, right? There's not just one and, oh, yeah, okay, done, it's done. When it comes to what we believe, 
or what we hold true, we, we always continually have to be in a reevaluation mode. Otherwise, we could get stuck. You know, I, I'm, I'm beginning to wonder, I mean, has, especially after this last conference, has the entire community begun to implode? Because, I mean, it seems like, yes, we do, most of us have a very conspiratorial slant, you know, the way we look at things. Uh, we have to in order to be able to embrace this. But then you, all of a sudden, everybody starts thinking, well, you know, maybe they're, they're a plant. You know, they're, they're a shill. I mean, the shill stuff started early, really, with Eric and, and Matt. Mm, yes. But there's a lot more of it now. I mean, there's, it seems to me, there's, there's like, it's just going crazy right now. I mean, is, is this, are you guys seeing the same thing? It, it, for me, it's just scaling. And that's just it. I mean, there's more, I mean, look, we just keep getting bigger and bigger. Good and point. with, and with that, we're going to get bigger and bigger trolls. Look at the mainstream groups that have trolled us. Uh, I know we'll get into it in a little bit, which is National Geographic. I mean, if you would have told me three years ago, the National Geographic would be trolling us. I was saying, yeah, what dream, what dreamland are you living in? And, and that's nothing. I mean, we've got most of the mainstream now that are, are coming at us in one form or another. So yeah, but we're shooting ourselves though, too. It's, I mean, it's some, a lot of, you know, fellow researchers where we should be, I mean, we already got the whole world against us to begin with. Sure. Sure. Uh, but, but some of that was, and in fact, I, I made sure, and I was glad that Daniel left that in which was the the Monty Python reference in the yeah. movie, which was, it's like, look, when you release a topic like this, when you start going down this rabbit hole, it generates so much raw enthusiasm that people don't know what they what to do with it. And the people that don't make channels, or even if they do make channels, I mean, we've seen it time and time again, where a where person has a new channel, they get 1,000 subs and then 5,000 subs, and then all of a sudden, they're like, hey, you know what, I got an opinion on a few things, I'm going to speak my mind, airing of grievances. And th- I mean, that's just how it goes. You know, it's the, it's the spirit of competition. It's, it's human beings. One one Yeah. I don't know. I mean, for me, I think it's the plan of the elite. It's a, it's a great plan, right? If you lie to a huge population, um, and those lies are coming from every direction, uh, not just maybe the, the head of that society, but if they're coming from every direction and then the people catch on to the fact that they're being lied to, um, all of a sudden, the first thing that you're going to do is be weary of everything that you hear. And so mm-hmm. in, in a, unique situation that we're in with being, you know, conspiracy researchers, you've got some people that have put a lot more time into certain conspiracies than others, um, or who may have jumped on a bandwagon or a certain belief and they believe wholeheartedly that that's true. And the problem is, uh, I guess for them, it's not a problem for me, but when they find somebody that doesn't have the exact same beliefs that they do, uh, Mm -hmm. they immediately think there's something up with that. For me, I can listen to anybody. It doesn't matter who it is, what channel it is. And I can take the good that they present um, and leave the bat. And, you know, if eventually I start following up on a couple of the things that they report and I can't find, um, you know, good sources, or it seems like they're just making stuff up, I just stop watching that channel. So for me, it's, it's really easy, but I think for a lot of people, um, they feel like a YouTube presenter better have the exact same beliefs as them. Um, yeah. and I feel that way. I mean, some people say that dinosaurs are fake. Some people, you know, and for me, I have my own personal belief about that. Um, you know, and so it becomes a problem. If I say something like, well, I don't think dinosaurs are fake. I just think that they're only 10 or 20,000 years old. Uh, immediately people jump on my back. Well, what are you saying? You believe in the brontosaurus and you, you know, it's like, no, I'm not saying that. I'm just saying there's big animals. And so I believe big animals lived a few thousand years ago. It's not even a big deal to me. It's not something I need to worry about. They lie about everything. And if it's animals from 65 million years ago, you can bet your ass are lying about it. Mm-hmm. Yeah. Yeah. And then you hear Jaron's a shell because he believes in dinosaurs. Right, exactly. Right. So, <laughs> and, and, the, and, the, and the truth is, and everyone here can agree on it, if we all wrote down our top 100 conspiracies in order of importance and passed it around, everyone would be like, really? I, I would never have guessed that. I mean, we'd all have different lists. And that's the what Jaron was saying. I, the, the Me having the exact same ideals as somebody else that's listening to my stuff is, is going to be pretty rare. And conspiracy people get very passionate about that. And it's like, why? You know, so there's some people to this day that think that 9-11 is, is the top, top tier of all uh, conspiracies. And it's like, no, no, no. And that's why they're mad at Flat Earth. It's like, really? 9-11? That's, that's what you're going to go with? That's your number one? But <laughs> That's entry whatever. level at this point. Yeah, it's like, really? <laughs> all right. <laughs> Fine. But but the, but again, what you were saying, you know, they spent so much time on it and all of a sudden, you know, Flat Earth comes in and just undermines the foundation of everything. And now some of these people are really hurt. Same thing with, um, what was it, Richard Hoagland. Remember, he was supposed to do that debate with uh, against David Weiss and I. And he completely backed out because it's like, well, 
he's one of the few conspiracies that doesn't that cannot dovetail into flat earth you either believe flat earth or you believe richard hogan stuff about you know the secret space program and he decided all right i'm leaving i'm going to retire you know, I was a big, I was, I was quite a bit into Enterprise Mission and you know all that uh, the secret program and yeah, actually dude. a lot of the the um, so, the sort of fringe Christian truther, uh, you know, prophecy type guys like David Flynn and some of these guys were, you know, they're banking on that material, the face on Mars, Cydonia, you know, all that kind of stuff, and then spinning it off, you know, into their whole whatever their personal belief is on it. But you know, consider the source. We're get where are we getting this information from? Right. I mean, what if he is controlled opposition? And mm. Of course, that's the other thing, people. You're either a shill or a controlled opposition, right? Right. Right. Yeah. You know, that's one of the, the things that really bothers me in the flat earth community itself is, is um, you know, there's so many different models that people believe in. Some, you know, some people believe in the Pac-Man model or um, they believe yeah. some people may think that, you know, Antarctica is actually there. And, uh, you know, I personally believe in the AE map and uh, I'm also a believer in the dome. And it's amazing how many people will say, well, you're obviously a shill because of that. And it's just, yeah, uh, you know, it's just not right because, you know, we on Globusters, we have a lot of different people on that present different models. And I personally love to, to, to listen and, and entertain the ideas of the other models because, you know, the only thing that we really seem to know for sure is that, you know, the earth is, is flat. Uh, obviously and observably flat as Nathan likes to say. Um, but as far as precisely how it works and how it's laid out, we don't really know that, but you know, part of the, part of the adventure and part of the fun in flat earth is figuring that out. But when people get so dogmatically caught up in a model, um, it really ruins it for everybody, especially when they're willing to call other people shills because of it. Yep. Yeah. Okay. So we get to about 48 minutes into the video and then they start addressing the, um, the ring gyro here, so I'll play that. These people can be very, very bright. So the issue is not necessarily lack of intelligence. It's not about being educated or uneducated or smart or dumb. It really isn't. Uh, I think it's sometimes miseducation. Uh, I think somebody can be educated in such a way that they are educated to distrust authority on a regular basis, which kind of poisons the well up and down the line. However, sometimes the question like this is helpful. What would be the type of evidence that would make you review your position? Is there any kind of test? I started a channel called Globebusters. Really, the goal was at the beginning was I wanted to be shown proof that the Earth was a ball because I was shocked to not find evidence. And then I was like, Bob, do you want to do like a weekly show? So this is where I broadcast the Globebuster show from. We do our show once a week, every Sunday. We are a grassroots group of engineers and scientists. We have done several experiments that show the Earth is flat. I mean, I think that the scientific method is the best way to get to the truth. And I just want to feel comfortable in things that I believe. The difference between being skeptical about something and being in denial is very subtle but very important, right? Someone who is skeptical is willing to test their own hypothesis their own assumptions. They are actually looking for the truth, even if it turns out that they were wrong. Recently, we carried out an experiment to test the rotation to the Earth. If the Earth is spinning at one rotation every 24 hours, that means that every hour it has to turn 15 degrees. And if the gyroscope is mounted anywhere on Earth, it's going to drift. In today's 21st century navigation systems, they're using what's called a ring laser gyroscope. It was extremely precise. If we could simply get one of these ring laser gyroscopes, we would be able to prove once and for all that there is no rotation to the Earth. One of the people in the community actually purchased one for $20,000. You start at point A, and then you do some kind of process of collecting evidence, of thinking, or whatever you want, and you end up at a conclusion, point B, that you believe is true, okay? Science is the arrow. That's all science is, is the arrow. Science is a process to get to conclusions. But what we found is, is when we turned on that gyroscope, we found that we were picking up a drift, a 15 degree per hour drift. Now, <laughs> obviously we were taken aback by that. Wow, that's kind of a, a problem, <laughs> right? So what's the rest of the story on that, Bob? Okay, well, the rest of the story on that 
is um, yes, we absolutely did pick up a 15 degree per hour drift, or I should say Rick did. And um, we determined, you know, we were originally, we hadn't put it together. And I, it's interesting because I had done lectures on Sanyak and, and uh, Michelson Gale and Michelson Morley, and it really didn't even occur to me at that time what was going on. So, Um, pretty soon we figured it out and decided, well, this has got to be this rotational energy coming in from the stars. Um, Mm -hmm. And so we set out to try and figure out a few different ways to prove it. And we tried uh, using a um, a Helmholtz coil and a a zero Gauss chamber, and possibly we even discussed uh, encasing it uh, in bismuth, uh, trying all these different methodologies to try and block this this, uh, incoming energy. But uh, you know, that's something that's really difficult to do. Now, one thing we were able to do is influence and kind of interfere with it uh, with a strong electromagnetic field uh, from the Helmholtz coil. But uh, uh, ultimately, you know, it occurred to me, it's like, wait a minute, we're picking up exactly the same rotational drift that uh, the Michelson-Gale experiment uh, picked up uh, 100 years ago, right? And, and uh, from that... Of course, they came out with uh, Aries failure they, because they tried to figure out, well, where is this energy coming from? Is it actually the Earth rotating or is it the stars rotating above us? And, of course, Aries failure, a uh, very simple experiment and very direct, um, you know, proved that it was the stars rotating above us. Furthermore, you know, in the Michelson-Morley experiment, when you're trying to – when they were trying to prove the Earth's speed around the sun at 67,000 miles an hour – um, they were not getting anywhere near that velocity. However, they were getting a very small velocity. And, of course, what that small velocity actually was was in the Michelson-Morley apparatus. It was still picking up this rotational energy, um, just barely cutting across those arms, and it was just kind of making it jump just a little bit, you know, the, detecting this motion. But what that motion was, again, was that rotational motion of the stars. And so, you know, it's been proven, you know, fairly conclusively that the Earth is not moving, absolutely not. But, uh, you know, all these other experiments right up to, you know, today are proving that it is indeed the stars that are moving. And that's right in um, Dr. Robertson Genesis wheelhouse. Now, he still believes in the Earth as a globe, but it's a stationary globe. But he would probably concur with all that as far as the movement of the stars, wouldn't he? Oh, absolutely he would. You betcha. In fact, he did a really good, uh, a really did good piece in that in his book. Um, that uh, another guy that we just interviewed on Sunday uh, actually put in one of his videos. So, um, yeah, Robertson Genis is fully aware of this, and so is Malcolm Bowden, who is a geocentrist also. Um, but this is stuff that they no longer teach in schools, and in fact, they do everything they can do to obfuscate these points and just mm-hmm. flat out, you know, deny them. Yeah, of course, but the way this video is edited, it you know, they set it up. You know, science is supposed to be, you know, when, you, without preconceived bias, you're supposed to just look at the evidence and let it speak for itself, and then they show you, and, well, it showed 15 degrees. So it, the way they edit this, it makes it look like you guys are just making excuses for why you're not going to believe what your own test showed you. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> So, you know, what do you do? Uh, so what we're trying to do then to elaborate on these experiments is uh, obviously you're familiar with F.E. Core because you're in it. Mm-hmm. <laughs> but, uh, I mean, we're trying to reproduce some of these experiments and bring them into, you know, the modern day um, using modern day 21st century test equipment and just uh, elaborate on these things. So, um, you know, all we can do is continue you know, doing these tests and doing this research and presenting our evidence to the public. And really, what we're really aiming for is trying to present this evidence to the universities and other professionals. And what's really cool about it is is there are a lot of, of major um, engineers and scientists and physicists that are actually joining uh, FE Core. You know, like I was saying on Globuster Sunday, we actually have a guy that I met at the uh, FEIC 2018 in Denver. Uh, who is an engineer scientist at uh, Los Alamos National Laboratories. And Mm -hmm. uh, he's very much a flat earther and very much into this and, and, you know, is all about proving this. So, you know, our our technical community is absolutely growing because really when when the scientists and engineers actually take a look at this data, um, it makes them pause and step back and go, wait a minute, you know, there's something to this. Mm -hmm. 
Yeah. Yeah. I, I remember that guy, uh, he came to me and he was talking to me. He's like, you, you really need to know all this stuff. And he was talking way over my head and I, I walked him over to your table and I was like, here's the guy you need to talk to the Los Alamos <laughs> guy. Uh, yeah. Yep. I remember that there were actually, there were a couple of, uh, physicist engineers there that I talked to that had some questions and, uh, I was very pleased that one lady in particular brought her husband. Um, and, uh, you know, after I got done talking to him, you know, it, pretty much he was convinced, uh, which really made me feel good. So, yeah. Yeah. Right on. So on a lighter note, uh, I thought it was kind of funny when, uh, Mark, I think you were, if I'm not mistaken, visiting Patricia in Houston and they right. show you guys watching a movie, uh, mm. <laughs> Mark goes, what do you think? Sure, she goes, the popcorn's great. <laughs> <laughs> well, no, and I was asking about the popcorn. Oh, whoa, I, you were. I, was, I, I wasn't asking about the movie. The movie was oh. Dark City. Yeah, and we'd no, already no. seen Dark City prior to that, just right. on our own. But oh. we just were watching it again together. But yeah. he did make special popcorn, and that was filmed but never shown, uh, with coconut oil and his own special methodology uh, yeah. that was pretty fun. And, you know, we were trying it out, so... Yeah, the way that's cut, again, the way they cut that scene, it's like they, they show ahead. the movie and they kind of pan from you from from the from the TV to you guys on the couch and, and you're like, so what do you think? And just <laughs> goes, oh, the popcorn's good. It makes it like, yeah, this movie sucks, but I like your popcorn. <laughs> Funny, more editing magic. <laughs> yeah, nice. Uh, okay, we got a few minutes before break. I'm going to try to play another clip here. <clears throat> um, they show a, a meetup group. I think it was in Pasadena or someplace. And then uh, somewhere nearby, there's another meeting with the astrophysicists and NASA people. Yep. And one of the guys was speaking, and this is a clip of him. Truthers, flat earthers, anti-vaxxers. When we leave people behind, we leave bright minds to mutate and stagnate. These folks are potential scientists gone completely wrong. Their natural inquisitive and rejection of norms could be beneficial to science if they were more scientifically literate. Let's take the metaphor of uh, argument is war. One side wins and the other loses. If my opponent feels he's better than me, that's intolerable to me. So I'll, I'll not listen to what he says. Already when he's talking, I'll be planning my counterattack. Another way of thinking about it is let's go and explore together. And this exploring together takes us to another place than argument. So every flat earther shouldn't be held with the contempt, but serve as a reminder of a scientist that could have been, someone that fell through the cracks. And we as ambassadors of science are called upon to do more, right? So scientists of varying degrees of professionalism seriously consider becoming a mentor to someone who is coming from a non-traditional point of entry to the sciences. If you're not willing to engage with them, you you can't expect them to change. You just hope that they will meet you even halfway, but often when you push them to the corner, it takes a lot of effort for them to even move one step towards you. Okay, that sounds good on the surface until you realize there's, they are taking the position that we're right, that, that they are right. Of course. And on you, top you know, of that, if, too, if, I don't know, if, I don't know if, if this is 100% true, but it's what I could tell. I've only seen the movie once, but I think that gentleman is actually reading from a screen. Yeah. that is set up behind the crowd, which means that the whole thing was a setup. The whole thing was, let's get these all these scientists there, and then we want you to speak about Flat Earth because we're going to yes. be filming it for the Flat Earth documentary, so we want you to say something about Flat Earth beliefs. So the whole thing is just garbage. Yes, I thought that too when I watched it. I'm glad you said that because I've never expressed that out loud before. What are the chances of there being a that kind of a meetup with people who are all about science and the globe meeting in a bar? That's yeah, um, most people believe in science and the globe. So they actually have special meetings for what most people do. So they have special meetings about toilet paper too, maybe, or I mean, other thing, doing laundry, they gather at bars, average things people do in their life. No, I don't think so. Flat earth meetings. Yes, because we're a niche group. Right. It just seems like to me, like people, it's, it's so easy for me to see this and then recognize that it's a movie. And yeah. if you look at it as a movie, I really honestly say it was well done. It's a, it's very pretty. It's mm -hmm. visually oh, exciting. Yeah. Um, I like it as a movie. Now, the fact that I'm in it and that I've been misrepresented and that you know, this you know, filming a house next door to mine to make me look bad and that this guy's <laughs> reading from a prompter. Those How many cats do you have, man? <laughs> <laughs> How many bricks are holding up my house? How many bricks <laughs> are holding up that deck? <laughs> yep. 
I, I, I agree, Jaron. They, they they filmed me to make it look like I have like 12, 15 cats because they filmed them jumping. I do have three, but the, I was portrayed as sort of this kind of a crazy cat lady. Oh, or something. I don't know. They were they were kind to you. Come on, let's be honest here. They're you were you were shot in a very soft light. We, hey, how how many minutes till break, uh, Rob? Say again. How many minutes till break? Uh, we got about thirty seconds to break. Ah, uh, crap. All right. Well, I'll 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 make a, a statement after if you if you don't mind then. Later. Say, thank God they didn't film my my neighbor because she had no teeth. <laughs> that would have been portrayed <laughs> as your wife. <laughs> Is that Jared's <laughs> wife? <laughs> made it seem like it was Miss. <laughs> That's her mother. She wasn't around, I guess. Ah, uh, wonderful. <laughs> yeah, on that note, we'll uh, <laughs> we'll go to break. When we come back from break. Uh, we'll start to segue and talk about the um, the National Geographic video that came out recently regarding the uh, Salton Sea test and um, how they misrepresented that too. When we come back from the break, imagine that, <laughs> right? All right, sounds like a plan. Protection from, from deception. Back on the Revolutionary Radio Project, I am your host Rob Skiba for the final half-hour segment of the broadcast. We have been talking about the documentary Behind the Curve. Uh, we're going to shift gears in a minute here and talk about another documentary short film that came out by National Geographic. But I think uh, Mark, you had something you wanted to say before we went to break. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Just real quick. I mean, yeah, the movie is what it is, and uh, you know there'll be a lot of disagreements on it as it unfolds. And I don't know if the director and producers did it deliberately, but what I saw, you know, as this thing was rolled out in film festivals was that I, it planted the seed very, very well and generated a huge amount of interest. Uh, in fact, I'm looking at the screenings right now. There's a screening tomorrow at the Museum of Science and History in Chicago. It did 22 film festivals in seven countries. And that's no small feat for, you know, a, a, you know, a real low budget, you know, running on fumes documentary team. And the ones that I went to, everybody that was there that stayed for there was a QA, and a my my Lord, that generated a lot of questions. I mean, for pure up, you know, hitting, planting the seed in globalists, uh, I'd recommend it every time. So that's that's my little two cents. OK. Uh, and by. Uh, in order to segue, there's an interesting way they ended the uh, behind the curve. Uh, <laughs> besides the the Jaren experiment, yeah. Uh, I'm going to play that clip right now. Hang on. Mark, my grandkids are 12, 10, and 8 years old, and are all third generation flat earthers. You convinced me nearly two years ago. I pass it on to my kids, and together we pass it on to my grandchildren. So flat earthers, pretty innocuous, right? Yeah, people could believe what they want. It's a little bit funny, even if you don't spend too much time thinking about it. When their science teacher was telling the kids the Earth spins at a thousand miles an hour and goes around the sun, the class erupted with about a third of the class saying, no, it doesn't. But the problem is that this isn't a phenomenon restricted to flat earthers. They try to make other people believe it, and then those people take it a step further and then just kind of, you know, discount all kinds of scientific principles. Long live Flat Earth. <laughs> cool. Thank you. Hey, very welcome, man. What is it that you want them to take away 
question everything. Don't assume anything when it comes to what you're told. If you're wrong about this, what else do you want to, you know, revisit? Evolution, the Big Bang. It runs the gamut from people that are anti-vaxxers. Denial of evolution, because it conflicts with the Bible, for example. And all of a sudden you get people that maybe work in our government that don't believe what 97% of all climate experts say. And so they're making uninformed or poorly informed decisions. And that affects all of us. Okay. Now, <clears throat> that was the major vibe that I got out of the National Geographic piece. Yeah. And well, and 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 that's not a that's not an accident because National Geographic contacted us based on two things. One was they'd only seen the trailer for that movie because the movie wasn't out yet. And two, they read the U.gov survey, which, you know, talked about the 18 to 24 year olds in the United States, how only a third of them uh, or two thirds of them believed in the globe anymore. A full third weren't weren't buying the globe. And that's when they, they, they called me and said, uh, we should, you know, they really dragged me into that one, into the Salton Sea. And, you know, go ahead. <laughs> Well, yeah, um, there's another guy. I don't know if you guys have seen this video. Uh, his YouTube channel is J Dreamer Z. Yeah. Uh, he did a piece he released uh, six days ago called, it's an hour, it's a two hour video. Nat Geo, Flat Earth is Dangerous, all caps, yeah. exclamation point. Uh, yep. Did you guys see that video? Yep. Yep, I did. Uh, yeah, I thought he did a really good uh, breakdown of that. And you know, here's the thing. These guys, okay, climate change, that's, and that's always associated with flat earth. I mean, if you go back and look at the days when Obama was talking about it, it was always in the context of, you know, we don't have a time for a meeting with the Flat Earth Society with regard to climate change. And so they are afraid that people like us are going to somehow dictate policy that will affect everybody when they are the ones who they, they're convinced that the earth is headed for some kind of uh, – extinction level event due to climate change so what's their solution poisoning every living thing on earth with chemtrails <laughs> brilliant like, yeah i mean they are literally causing mass extinction already it, so it's their worldview that is having a very negative effect on everybody right now fr from the smallest insect to plants to of course human beings as well like that just infuriated me watching them say that with the arrogance that they said that we, you know, we got to shut these people up because, you know, w if, if one of their people gets in power, you know, it, it, their thinking is going to affect all of us when in fact we are being affected by their thinking. Like what, what kind of genius wakes up in the morning and says, let's spray the sky full of metal particulates. Yeah. yeah. We're, oh, we're, we're absolutely a threat to national geographic. No question. I mean, we're a threat to their, their content. And I mean, there were questions, you know, they, they only showed, I think, 30 seconds of me sitting with the, uh, the on-air host at that picnic table. It was yeah. just her and I. And the question she was asking me, I've never gotten those questions before in three years plus of doing this, which was, you know, she was asking me point blank and it was the producer's questions, not her. She doesn't say anything, you know, nothing comes from her. And she said, you know, what happens when flat earth gets beyond uh, your guys' control? What happens to medicine? What happens to uh, technology? What happens to you know to to the civilization? And I said, "Wow, you're you're kind of play, painting this pretty bleak." And she goes, "Isn't that where it's going?" I'm going, "No, I don't think yeah. that. I don't think that at all." So this just shows they are so threatened. Yeah. By all this now, of course the the other documentary we were talking about, Behind the Curve, ends with uh, Jaron doing a test that the way they depict it. Uh, certainly makes it look like, oh, shoot, that's not the, the result that we were looking for. Uh, bummer. You know, like, I know there's more to that story. So maybe, Jaron, you can segue from the rest of the story and that into what was going on at the Salton Sea. Yeah, sure. I mean, um, the great thing was is that they had called me and said, hey, we heard you're doing this canal test and can we come film it? And I said, yeah, great. That sounds fantastic. It kind of took a weight off my shoulders that I wouldn't have to film the experiment. And so they, um, you know, got there and filmed it. And there was the the scene that they put at the end of the movie was in about the middle of the night, uh, you know, or the middle of the evening that we were doing the test. Uh, at one point, we weren't getting the kind of results that uh, we would have needed to have anything definitive. And so we just kind of started asking the person that was four miles away 
to move the light in different directions, put it above your head, whatever. And at some point we said, oh, now put the light above your head. And he put it above his head and we saw the light. And I said, interesting, you know, what's going on here? And then we would say, okay, step to the side, step back, step. And then we saw a result eventually that would have been flat earth proof. But there was globe earthers there. There was flat earthers there. And we all walked away from those experiments saying nothing was nothing was proven here tonight. We saw evidence of both. There was equally evidence of both. It was, uh, you know, not a good test, not a successful test. Uh, the laser beam didn't stay at the size that we would have needed it to have any kind of definitive proof anyway. That's why the test was changed kind of last minute just to say, okay, let's see if we can just see this light. When originally the test was to send a laser beam through each of those cutout holes. So it was kind of like a, a little added thing. Um, and, you know, the first night that we went out there and did the test too, they were there as well. And that's when we had to shut it down because... Um, I had a focuser beam on my laser and we had the laser on for too long and it actually melted the focuser beam onto my laser and I couldn't get it off and it wasn't getting the the size of the uh, the beam diameter that we needed. So all in all, it was just kind of a failed test and I was upset about myself. I really didn't think they would actually put it in the movie because it was nothing definitive. And uh, he was there, I'm talking about Daniel, the entire time for both experiments. So he clearly knew what the outcome was, which was nothing. The, the test proved nothing. We had to walk away from that and say, well, we saw nothing tonight that is any kind of proof. Um, but for him to go back and pull that one scene out and put it at the end of the movie as if that was the result of the test was pretty upsetting, you know, because all in all, um, I at least expected him to. And this is another thing I wanted to mention, just if people don't know this. But originally, uh, as soon as they were done shooting that test, I said, hey, can you send me the footage? I want to just at least show my subscribers and my patrons that uh, we did the test and what happened. And they said, oh, no, we can't give you any of the footage until we sell the film. And I said, what? Well, how long is that going to take? They said, oh, it could take a year. We got a lot of things to do. I said, okay, well, it, when you do finally sell the film, whatever scenes you have that don't make the film, can I have those so that I can at least put them on my channel and show people that we did the test? And they said, oh, yeah, that's fine. Just wait till we sell the film. So eventually they sell the film and I contacted them again and say, okay, now can I get that footage? And they said, no, the deal we have with Netflix, the deal we have with iTunes is that none of the scenes can be, can be, you know, we can't give you any of that footage, which is just bull. You know, yeah. it's, it, it's just this complete and total nonsense that why would you not? Well, the reason why is because if they ever released their other footage that they have, I would be able to show, hey, mm -hmm. look, at this scene was in the middle of the experiment. It proved nothing. Here's a scene later where we did show flat earth evidence. And even these globe believers that were down my neck the entire experiment, I mean, watching every single thing I did, um, walked away from it and said nothing was shown here tonight. So I would be able to show that to people and show that the movie took everything out of context. Well, they can't ever allow me to have that footage. So mm -hmm. they've just lied now at this point and told me, nope, can't give it the footage. So it was upsetting. And, and I kind of blame myself for it, too, because I kind of looked and I said, man, if we would have had a successful test, if I would have done this right, they couldn't have done that. They, but then I look at it and say, well, couldn't they have? I mean, if, if even if we did show flat earth uh, evidence at the end of those tests, who's to say they wouldn't have just taken that one little scene anyway and put it at the end of the movie? So, again, I recognize it for what it is. It's a movie uh, made by Globe Believers uh, to kind of highlight the flat earth movement, to highlight some people in it. But then also at the end, they want to show people that the earth is is curved. I mean, that's that was their goal. Yeah, their, their, their goal was to find an interesting topic that was getting a lot of traction lately and make a film about it with their knowledge that the Earth is a globe. So they basically rode flat Earth like a bicycle all the way to the bank. But it was a pretty watch. It was entertaining. But for those of us who are involved in flat Earth and this awakening, very infuriating. <laughs> right. You said that perfectly. Yeah. If I was just a, a random observer and uh, went to a movie screening and saw that film, I would think it was very well done. But again, that's clever editing. And uh, you have to be, you know, there was only probably 20 people at that experiment. And so I only have 20 people on my side that would would come back and say, no, that's completely horseshit. Other than that, it's their word against mine. And then we have the Nat Geo, which I streamed about three hours worth of it on my cell phone through mm -hmm. Jaren's channel. Um, and wow, I mean, first of all, well, Jaren, you did a really good video uh, before that, uh, or right around the same time. Uh, I think it was right after that, actually. You put a video out about all the reasons why that location, that time of the year, everything, why don't you kind of recap that, why it was all wrong for doing a legitimate test, but right to get the results that they wanted. 
Right. I mean, they made sure they put it and, you know, the Salton Sea is, you know, one of the largest lakes. Uh, I don't know if it's the largest lake in the country or it, maybe it's just California, but it's also right there, uh, really close to actually Death Valley. Uh, I think it's 200 and something feet below sea level. It sits basically in a bowl. So it gets very hot there and the humid air stays there and, it, you know, it gets trapped there. So late at night, it'll be very hot there. Early in the morning, it'll be very hot there. And that's the worst possible conditions to show what we're trying to show. You know, I keep mentioning this uh, Monterey 13 and a half mile mirror observation where somebody was sitting there with a mirror on the ground, on the beach level, and the camera is 13 miles away, uh, three foot high, and there should be a 40 foot hump of water between the observer and the mirror that's sitting on the beach. But you can easily see the reflection in the mirror. And if anybody knows how a uh, heliograph works and how they used to use these mirrors for long distance communication and signaling in the war, uh, the, the point of it is that you have to have line of sight to that mirror to see the signal. So that right there tells you that when, and they did that test in the winter when there's not that heavy bit of water. And that's, you know, so I keep challenging Nat Geo. I'm like, why doesn't Nat Geo go and show this? Well, they'll never show that, right? So they purposely set up the experiment in a very hot place with a very humid air. And that's the absolute worst because everything above that water is very hot air and it's very murky and it's hard to see. So yeah, there's no doubt that when they put up these balloons and they're raising them up, that you're not going to see what you're trying to see until it gets above that layer of mucky air. So it just was uh, kind of what we expected. And thank you for your you know comment on that video because I had to go back and say, man, we have to show what they're doing here and then to see the Nat Geo piece. And by the way, for people who don't know, National Geographic is now part of Disney. So mm. should we expect anything else. Well, in na 1969, on the cover of National Geographic magazine, First Explorers on the Moon, Apollo 11, Yep, they've been with the whole moon thing and all of space since 1969. And they're not going anywhere. They're not going with us, that's for sure. Right. Well, what would happen to these channels like Discovery Channel, History Channel, uh, Nat Geo, if the Flat Earth uh, became mainstream? Th these places would be gone. People would not respect channels like that anymore that have spent 30 years uh, putting up CGI images of, of mysterious planets in the sky. You know, it's just that's the way that they're going to be. And we should expect that and not be surprised by it. Um, but again, now we should challenge them to, you know, go to a place like, you know, the Monterey Bay where we can actually look further, even 25 miles across the bay from Monterey to Santa Cruz and do it during the winter. But they'll never do that. And that's what I hope people recognize is that um, if this was a real documentary crew or National Geographic really cared about the truth, then they would go to a flat earth experiment that we've devised, not the IIG, the, you know, international group or whatever that group is that, you know, did that test at the Salton Sea, but they're yeah. the ones that set that up and their goal also, that organization would be gone the second flat earth came out. Right. You know. And, and, and also real quick, uh, was the, the experiment that was done there, the, the raft test is shown. And by the way, you guys can, anyone can watch this. It's uh, called flat earth versus round earth on the national geographic channel. It's already got like 400,000 hits in a week, but the, the balloon test was completely cut yeah. out, completely yep. removed from, from the, I mean, that obviously that says something. It's like the, the raft test, that was their backup test. And, and that one initially failed. It took forever. Um, if you go back and watch the live stream, Jaron and I are just sitting, I'm sitting on a picnic table, just chatting with him for like, uh, it had to be close to a half hour, 45 minutes while they're trying to, you know, get that thing going. But that was like, I want to say 10 o'clock in the morning. Yeah. I mean, oh, we yeah. got there at like what? Five 30, something like that. Oh yeah. yeah. Oh yeah. We were there at 5 AM. It was like field of dreams. It, I mean, <laughs> be, they, I mean, they national geographic was begging me at the meetup two days earlier going, can we get people to the, uh, to this thing at uh, going 5 AM on a Sunday out at that, that place. Are you kidding? I'll be darned if they didn't show up. Flat yeah. earthers just driving in from all over the place. It's like right on. But, uh, but yeah, by the time they were shooting, because they shot so late, the temperature had gone up and I'm screaming at them. I'm going, look, the mountains off in the distance, they're disappearing mm -hmm. every 15 minutes. And, you know, people are giving me hell. It's like, why aren't you, you giving more rebuttals? I'm going, are you kidding? This is, this piece is only 10 minutes long. I go, I was with them for three days. My voice was getting hoarse by the time I was done, you know, yelling at these guys. And they, I mean, hell Rob, you were there. I mean, we, sh we shot so much footage. Uh, of this and then they released this little snippet with no details at all they didn't even say how far the raft was yeah there was no well if i remember right they did manage to recruit one of our guys or gals somebody they want they were looking for a short lightweight person from our camp 
right. to go with them to verify that they didn't dip it into the water or cheat. Uh, I don't remember how that happened or if that happened, but the point was, you know, I called it very early on when I got there, one of their guys interviewed me and I said, you're going to get the exact results you're looking for. And right said the same thing Jared did because of all the conditions and, and you know, you were saying it, Mark, everybody was saying, it's like, look, we've done all this stuff. We've done yeah. the trial and error. We learned what work, what doesn't work. We've done dozens of these tests already. This yeah. is nothing new. You're going to get the exact results that you're looking for because of these conditions. And then throughout the day, Mark's pointing out, well, see that, that little hill over there, that that's going to be gone in about an hour from now. And sure enough, it was gone. You mm-hmm. know, like things at a distance were rapidly disappearing simply because of the temperature increasing. The- the perfect shots that they had was when we first got there. I mean, when it was dead calm at five in the morning and you could see the lights from the beach houses on the other side right. perfectly. It's like, it's like, oh man, I hope they get this. Nope. <laughs> They're not going to show any of that. Didn't show any of the balloon. I mean, again, you threw out the entire main test from the balloon footage. Yeah, that says something. Well, but, and that, I don't know if we, if anybody on our team got this. I just remember the dialogue that. We were the ones, the flat earthers were the ones that showed them where oh, yeah. their own people were because we saw it before they launched it, right. which means the balloon was, like, I think, 10 feet off the ground after it was inflated, but there's expected curvature of 30 something feet. So yeah. we, one of our guys or several of our guys they, were on they, the other side with the balloons and they're, they're like, and, and we, we spotted it and showed them where their own guys were. And they're like, no, that's impossible because of the curve of the earth before yeah. they even launched the balloon. You, they can't see it because the curve of the earth, but they're like, no, yeah. we do see it. Yeah, yeah, they didn't put any of that in there at all. Yeah, it was amazing. It, and again, but it, again, we, we knew this one going in. And that was, okay, it's National Geographic. It might as well be the History Channel or the Discovery Channel. If anyone's going to hit us, it's going to be these guys. Uh, and uh, to be fair to the the production team that was out there, because they sent, I mean, it was a it, they sent a full eight man team to this thing. Uh, they were just shooting as much as they could, and then they sent it off to New York. And it was the main office that were the ones. It's different from a movie where the main office is the ones that decides what's what's in and what's not. And but what I was told is like, yeah, they don't like us very much at <laughs> the main office. Yeah, well, well it's the same thing that happened to Bob. Bob did that uh, interview with the girl from the Denver News and did a great little piece, and she was very uh, open to Flat Earth and did a nice a, a nice little piece, and Bob expected there was going to be segments, uh, and she never was seen again. Wow. That's, yeah, she was supposed to show up at the uh, FEIC conference in Denver, and when I asked her what happened to you, oh, I got I got reassigned to something. So it's like, <laughs> yeah, okay, I know what happened. <laughs> or she didn't uh, Mark, you'll remember his name. He either quit, got fired, or left. The one guy who, would, at least you and I, especially you, had his ear, and you were trying to feed him the newer salt and sea tests that were done in a more favorable uh, environment. Oh, yeah, where the yeah, temperature yeah. The, was the, better. What was that guy's the, name? The he field, disappeared. The field producer for Na- the field producer for National Geographic, Justin. Justin, yeah, where are you? Yeah, yeah, he's gone. He, buried he, he in a let... shallow grave somewhere in the <laughs> desert because no, no, he knew no. the truth about uh, He's part of the millennials. He didn't, uh, I, apparently people jump uh, jump ship uh, quite quite often in business like that. And so he left before the segment was even finished. But when you leave, you kind of keep your tabs on what, what you did, uh, you know, because technically he's on the credits as the field producer. And, uh, yeah, but yeah, he was gone before the, the thing was even released. And again, also remember this thing was shot in August mm-hmm. and they didn't even release it until, well, on YouTube until just a week ago, January 16th. So it took them a while. They, they drug their heels on this thing and they, yeah, they was postponed several times. It was supposed to come out before the Denver conference and right. it didn't, they, uh, they just kept dragging their feet for obvious reasons. But it seemed like the, the and I think this uh, J Dreamer Z guy really nailed it. It's like they spun the whole thing with 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 wordplay right from the beginning of her dialogue, right through to the end of the dialogue that we're right. dangerous. Yeah. Like, like as if we are the people to to be calling the FBI on. You know. Oh, she like, she right. and I got into it for a little while, and I don't know if she was doing it for the. I mean, we were filming, so I don't know if she was doing it for the cameras. But she came straight at me when it was just one on one, and she said, "Look, Terry Terry Verts is a friend of mine, you know, a good friend." And you're and you know, I've heard this before. It's like, are you calling him a liar? You know, are you are you saying that you know he he's lying? I'm going, look, he's United States military. You know, he he's a he's a colonel in the Air Force. You know, I'm not saying he's a horrible guy. He's doing it for God and country, but yeah, he's lying. 
Yeah. And, uh, you know, and she's, well, you know, I take personal offense to that. Like, Fine. Take Did personal you? offense. Not going to change my opinion. So she wow. was very brusque. Uh, the woman with the scarf, if anybody saw this, yes. you know, this um, neck scarf, she was she sort of snubbed me anytime she saw me. She would kind of just walk in front of me. I don't know what it was. It's like she disliked my presence there. It was weird. Just got a bad vibe. And sometimes you have to trust that. Well, you, well, she. I think a lot of them came. You know, when they went to the meetup, we had a hundred people show up at that meetup in uh, Los Angeles, and they were really surprised. And she didn't know what she was walking into. And remember, there was a point. I don't know if you remember this, where they, everybody had their camera phones up and they were pointing them at her. And she's going, "I've never seen this before. Why are they <laughs> filming me?" It's like it's a conspiracy crowd. We film everything. And, and and she's like, "I'm not comfortable with this." I'm going, "Well, what are you gonna do?" So. Well, it, that's been my my criteria. If you want to interview me, I'm videotaping you the right. whole thing. Right. You know, I'm, and, I'm, and I'm in front of the camera. Luckily for us, that we released so much salt and sea footage uh, at the end of the summer. I mean, so much great stuff. And then the follow up tests, we we just we undermined everything they did. So anyone that's anyone in flat Earth, please by all means, search in YouTube, type in flat Earth, salt and sea, and watch the other stuff besides the uh, National Geographic piece. And check out the Nat Geo Flat Earth is Dangerous video commentary uh, by J Dreamer Z. And there's another one too. I, the other guy, he did it. In, he did it in black and white and reversed the image, trying to get away from. Oh, that's the, red. Red pill philosophy. Mm-hmm. Is that it? Yeah, yeah, his was good too. Both yeah. of them were pretty good, which which was great because my knee jerk response was, "Oh my god, I got to make a video to counter this one." And I was like, "I don't have time." I don't, like I was just frustrated. And then I said, "Oh, somebody else already did it." Yeah. Awesome. Yeah. Yeah, and they won't be the last. They'll be I hope they're I, uh, more out there. I just subscribed to J Dreamer Z and made a comment on his video. So, yeah, right yeah, he, he was at the conference. He's uh, he's a neighbor down in Colorado Springs here in Colorado. Oh, he's local for you. Yeah, yeah. Well, more or less, he's in Colorado Springs. It's about an hour south of here. But but mm-hmm. yeah, I met him at the conference. He was really a great guy, and I I love his channel. He's been watching it for a while. You know, I thought I was subscribed to him, which is weird. And I go back and I'm not. And it's one of those mystery unsubscribes that YouTube is famous for. Or maybe it's just me scrolling on my iPhone and I touch something and unsubscribe. I don't know. Either way, people, if they're subscribed to channels, should check periodically to see if they're still subscribed. Yeah. Well, we got about 30 seconds left. Anybody have any final words they want to get in before we go off? Bye. Thanks. (laughs) (laughs) Bye-bye now. Only I'm not sure if I would ever do it again if uh, somebody came at me wanting to make a documentary. Yeah. No, yeah. I think Rob said it great, too. I, next time I would I would totally film the experiment. I mean, that would have There you go. Yeah, session. have multiple and Research the people who were doing the documentary. See if they were involved with National Geographic or, you know, Sandy, I don't know, Sandy Hook truthers. stuff. Yep. Not the truthers, whatever you call them. <laughs> yeah. yeah. <laughs> Thanks, hey, Rob. Yeah. Hey, guys. Thanks so much. Good catching up with you. Thanks for coming on tonight. And uh, thank you guys for listening to the Revolutionary Radio Project. We'll see you back next Wednesday evening, 11 p.m. Central Standard Time. Good night, everybody. Peace. Peace. Love the letter.